Welcome everybody to the Cambridge Union. My name is David Kwan and I'm the Equalities Officer. Let me just start um, by addressing the elephant in the room. And I'll do so by paraphrasing um, Tessa's um, opening for her newest novel, Free Love. The year is 2022. And like other great pieces of fiction, the organisation of this event has fittingly been quite a journey. Our wonderful women's and non-binary officer, Tanisha, had gone above and beyond to handle multiple cancellations due to the spread of Omicron. And yet today, we've just had another plot twist. Hours ago, the other panellist, Tamima, had to drop out due to COVID. And our moderator, Tanisha, notified me that she's now isolating, as half of Cambridge are. <laughs> but I, I, I would like to take this um, opportunity to thank them for their contributions, because they've worked very hard. This does mean, however, that we will turn this panel event into a single speaker event, and Tessa, we are enormously grateful to have you here. And um, many of the attendees here will probably already know who you are, but I thought I'll just give a brief introduction just in case. So Tessa Hadley is a British author who writes novels, short stories, and nonfiction. Her writing is realistic and focuses on family relationships. Her novels have twice reached the long list of the Orange Prize and the Wales Book of the Year. And in 2016, she won the Hawthornden Prize as well as one of, uh, as well as one of the Windham Campbell Literature Prizes for fiction. The Windham the, the, the Windham Campbell judges describe her as one of, one of English's finest contemporary writers and states that her writing brilliantly illuminates ordinary lives with extraordinary prose that is superbly controlled, psychologically acute, and subtly powerful. The Washington Post has described Hadley as one of the greatest stylists alive, and as of 2016, she's professor of creative writing at Bath Spa University. So Tessa, you once revealed that you are quite lazy in the mornings. You like your breakfast in bed and you read and drink tea and the time passes alarmingly. Was this morning the case? Uh, no, because I had to get up to come here, but not too horrendously early. Um, and actually, it's funny, I've got to stop. I've, I no longer have my breakfast in bed. We moved back to Cardiff from London where we'd lived in a small flat and it's two flights for my husband to bring the breakfast up, so I accept a cup of tea in bed, but I think anything else would be a bit monstrous. And but I retired from teaching a couple of years ago. I'm not at Bath Spa anymore. I am an emeritus professor or something there, although they seem to have cut my email off. So I, I'm, I'm sort of, I loved my time teaching, but I'm also, it's exciting being free. Well, we're so grateful to have you here. And when I was doing my research, your Wikipedia page was very, very impressive. But before all of that, Tessa, you weren't always um, this accomplished writer and didn't always have your books published. And I read somewhere, and you can confirm whether that's true or not, but you used to write diaries, and they're not, you're probably not most proud of those diary entries. And I was wondering if you had to write a diary entry for today, what would be in it? Ah. Uh. Diaries are a complicated story. I don't know how many of you keep them. I mean, they're fascinating in retrospect. They remind you that you remember nothing, that when you look back to your diary entries of 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 40 years ago, you think, uh, you know, they say things like, I can't live another day without M, and you can't remember who M was. <laughs> um, but. I, at some point, I realized I couldn't do it anymore because to get the truth of a day, what was today like? What did it consist of? What was it like getting up this morning in Cardiff, slightly anxious because no one's told me where I'm going to be staying in Cambridge? Is this thing really on or isn't it? And then on the train, looking out the window, beautiful window, then I'm reading something, I'm thinking, I'm remembering coming to Cambridge 45 years ago when I was a student, all that's flooding back. How am I going to get that into a diary? I can, because I'm a writer, but it would take me all day to write a day. So one's whole life would be strangely filled with just sitting, writing up 
what you've just done to, to get the truth of it, to get the right sentences and the right words. So at some point, quite early on, 17 or 18 or 19, I stopped keeping a diary, in fact. I just, it was, it was too, too difficult, too exhausting. The task of getting the truth down on the page, I've transferred to my novels, and it's less autobiographical, thank goodness, which is a relief. Thank you for sharing. Speaking of the word truth, I've got two points. Well, firstly, Tessa was a Cambridge alumni and graduated from the objectively best college in Cambridge, Clare College. The second point about truth, Tessa, is you used to be quite insecure about your writing, and I've read that you um, used to write fake books and you said you were almost trying to, uh, trying to imitate other people, and I was wondering... Yeah, okay, this is a that. long story, isn't it? So, uh, first of all, there's a, there's a whole story about being here in the 1970s, which is probably mildly interesting, though not that interesting to you lovely young ones here now. Um, I think it was, a, it was a funny place to be as a young woman then, because it was still essentially a men's world. There had been three women's colleges forever, for a long time, very dignified, Girton, um, Newnham, and there's another one, Newhall. But there were just three mixed colleges. I think I was the third year intake of women at Clare. And the whole institution felt intensely masculine. And it was, it sounds, I mean, I think in advance, I might have thought, well, that, that'll be fun, won't it, with all those men there? But it sort of wasn't actually. It was a place made for men that had the shape of men and smell like men. And I felt a bit superfluous, I think. I, I, didn't, I didn't love my time here. There were good things and bad things. And I think I was awkward. I was inept. It, it, for all we were just saying, some of us talking just now, that I think it was the moment historically when more young people from state education were here than at any time since. Nonetheless, it was still a bit of a posh person's place, unmistakably in those days. And I think I was clumsy, awkward, inept. That's how I remember myself. I don't like to think about that that much. The teaching, I enjoyed some of it. I'll tell you, I don't know if you still have supervisions here one-to-one. -one. I actually thought that I loved seminars. I wanted to be in a group of 10 people, giving and taking and chatting together. And something about the solitude of the one-to-one the -one was mostly a bit disappointing, which is a sad thing to say. Um, I had one wonderful teacher who none of you, even the English students, if any of you are taking English, will have heard of, because he sort of came and was here and had a little fan club. And then he, he's the kind of critic who leaves no traces. He actually, he died. He fell off a mountain in the 1990s, I think. Um, but he was a wonderful teacher, and I did love him, and I learned from him hugely. But the, it was something I felt I was sliding through Cambridge without it making much impression on me or... It's certainly not me making any impression on it, that's for sure, but that's fair enough. Uh, so, yeah, a funny place to have been. That was the first part of your remark, David. The second part, what was that about? Oh, all the years afterwards of me trying to be a novelist. I'd, when I was here, I think I put aside my childish thoughts. As a child, I had desperately wanted to write. I loved books more than anything. I found books, on the whole, easier than life. I, I was all right as a child. I was fine. I was happy and had friends, but I loved books. I lived in books. Um, when I was here, quite rightly, I'd sort of learned that, that shame and that modesty that you learn when you read the greats, when you read great writers. Actually, one of my lovely memories of being here, I'm being too disparaging about it, I have a lovely memory of a winter's day, and I was in the university library, think, in those days, no online catalogue. The great big old catalogues, are they still there like a museum piece? The great big old books you had to get out and open up like this and turn the pages. And I, I was reading Sophocles, uh, not in the Greek, obviously, in the translation, and I had it open on my desk and I was just 
thinking, here I am at the center of thought and being and culture and civilization, and here is these words astonishing in front of my eyes. So there, there were lovely moments of initiating myself into literature, poetry, drama, the novel. But it did give me a strong feeling, as it should, of the greatness of books. And beside that, I felt myself very small. And I don't even know, because we have a sort of feminist theme to our discussion, I don't even know how much my being a, a woman, a, a girl, played into that. I, I think it did. I think there was a sense that the great thinkers and the great writers were male, although that's absurd, isn't it, in our English tradition where we have Jane Austen and George Eliot and the Brontes and et cetera. But, but nonetheless, it did play. I felt that my women's intelligence was sometimes silly, intuitive, not, not authoritative. So it took me a long time. I am coming back to your point. It took me a long time to dare to be such a fool as to write for myself as, as who I was and to feel I had the authority to write. And I, I was, the desperation to write, the childish desperation to write returned. It came back to me in my 20s as I left Cambridge behind and I hungered to make books. But for actually 15 years or something, I wrote bad books, the ones you're talking about, David, the fake books, as I now know they were. I think even as I was writing them, I knew that, which was horrible because another bit of my brain tried to persuade myself, maybe they are all right, really, and I'm just being too self-doubting. But they were fake books, and I was trying to put on borrowed authority. And it took me till I was in my 40s, actually, for me to begin to find my own authority and put down perhaps the very small thing I knew, but authentically onto the page. When we think about the fake books and say fake books and real books, are they necessarily two different paths in different direction or does the real book come after the fake books? That's a good question. Uh, and it's something I've asked myself. I, I, was I on a lovely apprenticeship during all those years, failing but learning? And do you know, when I actually wrote the first true things I wrote, which were a few short stories first, where I, I felt, I found my feet, I knew what sentence should follow what sentence, it didn't feel like it was accumulation of all those errors. It felt like something else. It felt as if the errors needed to be put away and at last, I was on a different path. So, but I can't, I can't really finally answer whether maybe I did need to spend all that time. P people, people's talent for writing comes out at different moments. And some people start earlier and they just have it given them quickly to, set, to be able to say what they have to say. It's, it's lucky we live in the 21st century or I began writing, yeah, I, I was published in the 21st century because, you know, all those 19th century writers were dead by the time they were 40 or 45. So they didn't get the chance for the long, slow gestation, if that's what it was that I had. Mm. But anyway, I had it, and how lucky was that? Yeah, that's really, really interesting. You mentioned how you went to a horrible girls' grammar school and... And you also mentioned you're like a bookworm, you compulsive, like you love the library. And was the literary world a way for you to escape reality? And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I mean, definitely. It, that, that, that is part of what... We're really, we've, we, it's novel reading we're talking about, isn't it? Because poetry is different. I've never, I, I love some poetry, it's very important to me, but essentially I'm... I'm a novel reader, formed by reading novels from being a little girl. Undoubtedly, that's part of what the novel's mystique and magic is. You open the pages and you cross a threshold, you know, probably even though, whether you're English students or not, many of you have probably read Jane Eyre and you remember that, that opening. There was no 
I, I'm not going to get it word for word right, but there was no opportunity of a walk that, that afternoon. And Jane is sitting there reading her book and the November weather is lashing outside the window. And we're with her sort of in between the glass and the curtain. Um, you know, it, it's, it is escape. And actually, I've just described to you not only me or any reader escaping into the world of Jane, but Jane, with her book by, behind the curtain, escaping from the, the ho rather horrible familial world she lives in into, into her other world. So novels are an escape. But if they were just that, then Barbara Cartland would do, some silly romance would do, Shades of Grey or whatever it's called would do. So the, the, there's a sort of paradox, isn't there, that, that this form, which is like a miraculous door out of our limited particular circumstances and ourselves, I, at the same time, at its greatest, we ask that it bring us back to reality by, by another route. In other words, what we ask of the great novels, Jane Eyre and many, many others, is that it then takes us out of ourselves, but then enters us into a, a, a rich, real, taxing, exacting reality that we believe in and that changes us and informs us and, and makes us bigger. So it, it's a complicated answer to that one. If, if it were merely escapism, I wouldn't be interested in it. Absolutely. Um, great learning. And you mentioned how um, you've made some crucial life decisions based on the novels you've read. And I was wondering if you could share one example of that? Um, I probably shouldn't, no, no, you know, I, I just know that I was very much made by the novels I read, which were various, but certainly D.H. Lawrence, who I think is coming back into fashion, which is a great thing, but was incredibly out of fashion for 20 or 30 years. But, he, but in the 70s, he was still near enough to feel like a novelist stroke, visionary stroke, prophet. He won't, he'll come back as something else. He'll come back as a piece of history. And all of you, if you, if you read him, it will feel, you'll feel a distance that I didn't feel and many of us didn't feel in the 70s. But I, I would say that he was a huge influence on my life and that's a very dangerous thing. He's a prophetic, weird, half mad writer, half the time with mad things to say about what men are and what women are. Um, and it was rash to follow him. But at the same time, a kind of rashness is good. And somewhere he was a, a great prophet of, he, he wrote wonderfully about women, even if some of his ideas about women were troubling. He wrote these huge, brave, wild women who would not fit into the social forms that were there for them. And I probably did make some life decisions based on that. And that seems to me not so foolish in the long retrospect from now. On the theme of expectations, um, did you have expectations for yourself as a writer? And did your parents, for example, who are quite musical and artistic, um, did they put any pressure on you or were they always supportive of you pursuing your passions? I don't think they're very interested in my academic career, but that's not quite what you've asked about. No, I think, I think both my parents were, are, my mum's still alive, quite old fashioned actually. Um, my mum thought the most important thing in life was to be loved and sought after and admired and have a family and be glamorous. Um, they they had, weren't very interested in what I did at university. It wasn't because they were indifferent, but it wasn't very important to them. They weren't academic I people. Um, I read this very beautiful quote that you um, um, once expressed, and you said, my sons are exactly what I want because they are who they are. And I think that is very beautiful if you said that. <laughs> no, no, no absolutely, that is absolutely what I feel. They're lovely. I have three sons, and I actually have three stepsons as well who I didn't bring up, but I'm close to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not... I, I, all, all my three sons did go to university, but they sort of... They 
chose where they went, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think I put huge academic pressure on them. I've always been a bit of a skeptic, really. That was my D.H. Lawrence bit. And I think it was easier to be that in the 70s. I think there's a sort of a weight. I might be imagining it upon your generation now, academically. We were so heedless and silly in the 70s. We were so, we just made it up as we went along. And honestly, I came here with, with no sense of what I might do afterwards. No idea of it, no, not even thinking about it, just reading those books and thinking, how do I live, how do I live? And, and, and then my thoughts were to, to be married and to have children, not to be a boring housewife, but to live the personal life. Does that make sense to anybody now? I, I, I... Anyway, so I had no, actually no interest in a career, and then I ended up, as I was saying to some of you earlier, as, as a school teacher, disastrously hopeless at it, and had a baby quickly to get out of it. Um, and life unfolded from there. But I, I, I've... Even as a lover of literature and actually a sort of, I love criticism and I love writing about books, but I've always felt that even English as a subject and literature as a subject has one foot in the academy. And I more and more respect that as time goes on because I recognize that without that, books get forgotten and people don't give them the time. But it has one foot in the world and it scorns the academy. And I've always also clung to that. And I thought that even when I was here in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. You've often been in very male-dominated environments, even at home with three sons That's and three stepsons. Um, and the themes that you write are very um, realistic in, on motherhood, um, relationships, love, um, all of these things which you can elaborate more on. But how has your environment shaped your you know, conceptualization of women's role in society and, you know. Well, it's made me think about it all the time, hasn't it? As, as it would whatever had befallen me, even if I'd had three daughters, probably. Um, yeah, so, so that's what, in your life as a woman, you, you're thinking all the time and what, what exciting times these are and those were then to be all the time what am I doing here? Why, why, why am I being that and not that? And why wasn't I interested in being the wonderful things my daughters in law are? Why, you know, one in a civil servant in housing? Why, why, why wasn't I doing that? Um, why was I lazy and private? So, imagining what women are, what men are, thinking about whether the, 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 the differences, the nuances of of male and female being that I that seemed given in the 70s, where do they come from? When were they established? And how different that all feels now when, when the, that business of gender identity is so much up for debate and discussion. It feels so much more fluid than, than then. I mean, when I was here in the 70s, you know, there was so, just to get back to the, the novels that I know about, there were so many great women writers who weren't on the syllabus. They, that women of the 20th century, who we now take very seriously, weren't, that nobody read them. And we, there, there was a sense that, I wonder how much it still lingers, that authority, truth, certainty had a male voice. There's, mm. There's a, there's a, we could talk forever about this, but it, so it, life, life and thought and books all take one back to that fascinating business, which I hope I've continued into my novels without being polemical. I'm not a polemicist. I'm not good at that stuff. I'm, I'm much more good at embodying it and imagining this whole business of, um, so what is a woman? And what should a woman do? What should she want? And does she feel different from a man? And how, how are they disposing of their daily lives together? And who is doing the childcare? And does she want to do that? Is there some freedom in not being him with that public self to maintain going out to work? But is she also jealous of it? You know, that, that the infinite complexity of the way we men 
and women relate to each other and work out whoever we think we are according to the patterns that we take from the past and then mould and unpick towards the future. You successfully anticipated one of my questions again, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, you often explore what it means to be a part of a family and the modern family structure perhaps have altered and in your own reading and through your own lived experiences, what progressions have society made in the past several decades and where do you see us heading in I know, marriage and you talk about it being a fascinating thing and, Historically, you know, marriages have not lasted as long and it's often been ended due to death. And now you, you, you mentioned how, you know, you're staying with the same person who becomes almost in, unrecognisable, right? And I would love to hear your views on that. Uh, uh, what you're talking about there is some of the, the things I was thinking about in my last novel, not my newest one, but the last one was called Late in the Day and it was about a long marriage. And I was just thinking it, it's actually true that we think we get divorced now easily and that marriages don't last as long. Statistically, this simply isn't the case because most people died in the olden times. So the likelihood of anybody being married to anybody else for 60 years was sort of like the odds were so stacked against that. So we, of, of course, not, not everybody is married that long, but this weird phenomenon of choosing somebody to spend your life with when you're in your 20s. And then, across the breakfast table, you know, here is that old man. Oh, it's him. And, and how many times each of you, and he is, of course, I must add, looking across the breakfast table at this old woman he now sits opposite to every morning, makes tea for, willing to bring her her breakfast in bed even. And what, what a funny kind of contract that is. And... Each of you will probably have shed your skin and changed yourself thoroughly from top to bottom seven times over in that lifetime. And if you have clung on, you may not have, but if you have to that creature metamorphosing out of one being into another, well, that's a story. It's a story that novels are well made with their, with their, their own lengthiness and extension through time. They're, they're absolutely the literary form that's going to have fun dealing with everything that arises from that. Uh, the, about the future, I have no idea. Novels, novelists should never try and be prophets. I have no more idea than anybody else. Um, the family, I actually was listening to something on Radio 4 yesterday about how we all have to stop being in nuclear families and live communally which was also happening in the 70s. Another great subject for novels, by the way, communes, what fun that is. But it, it seemed, you know, right back from when Aeschylus, not in novels but in plays, wrote about Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and Orestes and that trauma within a family. The family unit is such a good subject for drama and then transposed into the novel. Um, but they're, they're those people who have not chosen to live together, some of them may have, they've married, but they're also, you know, parents, children, relations, and tied together inside a space, forced to coexist with all the tensions and love and hate that that involves. It, it's, it's a very, it's, it just seems like such an interesting subject and... I can't quite imagine a time when our writing fiction certainly won't have it, one of its great centres in that subject of the family. Your new book, Free Love, um, came out this month. Congratulations. And given roughly the time it takes to write a novel for you, about two to three years, I would assume, you, I assume you would have started before the pandemic and then... Mm continue the writing process during lockdowns and all the changes that's been happening. Has this kind of experience um, shaped your most recent writing and um, how has your views about the themes that you've talked about evolved, if at all? I was so glad I'd started my new novel, Free Love, which is, I, I was so, I'd started it before the pandemic. And I was so glad that it was set in 1967. That was a pure piece of luck. 
because I didn't have to address the strangeness of now, the strangeness of this thing, of you all sitting there with masks on, how weird it all is. Um, because I thought I hadn't digested it yet, so I wouldn't have known quite how to write about it. So it was a great relief to me that everything was 96. Even if I'd set it in, 19, in 2018, it would have still, the, the pandemic would, could have been off stage, but I would have known and the reader would have known that it was coming like a great big axe falling across life. So it would have been a nuisance writing wise. 67, it was fine. But I did, I, at the same time, the, the sheer curiousness of what was going on, of course, I was interested in how to write that. I think you've got to give it a bit of, a, a bit of time and space as a writer. But at the end of 2020, I think this is when this happened, I did write a short story, one of my short stories, which was directly set in the pandemic. In the pandemic, my husband and I moved down to our cottage in Somerset to be near my mum, who's, she's now 90, and my aunt, who's a couple of years younger. We made a kind of bubble with them. And so my story, which I actually, even though it's been in the New Yorker, I haven't shown it to my mum, um, is about somebody living with two old ladies under the condition. And so I'm playing with all that stuff. I'm playing with masking, and not being able to go out to the pub and not having your gardener doing the gardening, but you leave the money out for him in an envelope. So, but I haven't got anything to say about it. It's just befallen us. It's weird. I, I can't draw a moral from it, really, um, except the moral that everybody else has drawn. I often think that's what, that's what novels do. They're, they're, not, they're not polemics. They don't have an argument or the arguments are opaque and crisscross and self-contradictory. And the arguments have to be embodied in the life of the book. What you, you sort of, if you, the, the great challenge, the great difficulty, the great anguish for novelists is climate change. How to put that into a book without preaching? Setting out arguments that you all know anyway? It's, it's so hard to do, actually. I haven't succeeded in doing it. I don't know how to do it quite, but I think what you need to do, what I'm trying to do, is to get the political life of your moment with its urgent, urgent issues, climate change, inequality, globalization, and they should just be the ground from which your book grows. Don't, don't spend your time lecturing anybody about them, because all your readers will already know all that, and they'll have their thoughts. They don't need you being pious and leading the way or anything. You couldn't anyway. You're not, you're not that kind of thinker. But you should just have that as the ground from which your characters and their story and their being grows. So that's, my, that's, that's what I think about bringing the, the contemporary issues into fiction. I'd like to stay on the theme of the process of writing and how it all comes about from the ideas creation. And I also like the audience to um, engage. I'll just ask one more question on that theme and I would love for you all to just put your hand up. It's a great opportunity to pick um, Tessa's brain and thank you so much for what you've shared so far. But while our audiences think about their question, why don't you elaborate on what you mean by the seventh sense? Oh, what have I, I don't know. <laughs> what have I said about the seventh sense? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, David. No, no, that's all right. I can't you... be responsible for whatever. Strange things. So you said <laughs> a, a seventh sense, the one deployed when we stare and stare at the page and think, right. it's not right, something's missing, mm -hmm. something's um, inert or false in here. And our, maybe a question mm -hmm. might be, when did you develop that seventh sense and is that different to intuition? Well, it, it's a very practical craft, I, I don't really like talking about writing as craft, but it is a craft thing that, and it is, uh, it, it is, when I made the transition from writing fake novels and wrote the first little bits of story, I had my seventh sense said, yes, yes, you know what you're talking about, that, that sentence somehow is true, but I, I don't quite know what the criteria are. It's not rational, it's not quite, it's not thought. It feels aesthetic. 
It feels like a sense, like smell, like sight. Wittgenstein actually says something lovely. I'm not, not, I'm, I'm, you know, he's really hard, and I don't really understand all of it, but he's a great writer about language, obviously. And there's a lovely thing where he talks about the smell of a word, that when you're seeking and searching for a word, or, or surely for a sentence, or for a paragraph, it, the smell of it has to be right. And, and to me, it, it feels more like an I thing. I, I never... A lot of writers talk about the sound of the language. That seems, yeah, it's there, and I love reading out loud, but it's secondary. It's the eye, and it's when your eye sees those sentences laid out like that with the semicolons in exactly that place. And no, not that word, but that one, and that should be there. And then there's a sort of, there is a seventh sense that gives you confirmation that, that that's aesthetically truthful. But I have no idea where that's coming from. It's fascinating. I'm very curious about that whole process, but I would like to give our audience an opportunity. Does anybody have questions? Lily. I wanted to ask just how, in the beginning of your career, how you found time to write when you weren't necessarily a writer yet, but you're in the process of becoming one. Um, I know that many of us here are doing very intensive degrees, but have an itch to write creatively. And can't always find the time. So I was wondering how you found the time to do that, but also when you were starting a family as well. And also as a woman, a lot of the family duties do tend to fall on us, which isn't always fair. That's a discussion for another time. So I just, yeah. How did you find time to write and how that process played out in your life? I mean, that, that's a, quite an old fashioned story in a way. I have to confess that I think I made time around childcare. That it, because Although childcare fell quite heavily on me and my husband was going out to work every day, the, the baby slept for three hours and I became very brilliant at not caring that the house was disgusting and there was a plastic baby bath with bits of cotton wool floating in it. If he was asleep, I went and I wrote, even though I have to say in those early years, for years and years to the point of awfulness, that was a furtive and shaming activity because I didn't feel I was doing it very well, but I nonetheless had an insane need to do it. That's a, sort of another story. But I really did take advantage of a funny, old-fashioned gender arrangement. So, and, and with two babies, not so easy, but then they go to school. And when they're at school in the nursery for, from, I don't know what it was, but, you know, 1 to 3.30... That was my time, and you get very, very good at not having writer's block, not having, oh, my God, I need everything to be just perfect before I'm inspired. Just do it. Do it then, because that's all you've got, and then you've got to go out. And I can remember the, the wonderful feeling of postponement. I used to think, it will be awful when I have to do all the shopping and cleaning when the kid's around, and, but, but it, I, I am going to do that, because I... I will feel better for having done this writing. That was complicated because then I, it, it, it wasn't good, but I needed to do it. So that's an old-fashioned story, isn't it? And I, I don't know if I had a full-time job or if I'd done a serious degree like you instead of English where I was just messing around. But um, I, where would I have found that energy and freshness? Because there's another thing is... It's so different sitting down to write at 10 in the morning. You, you are so much cleverer than you are at 7 in the evening. Can't do it. Or much harder, much harder. So, so it's, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I actually think that some of the greatness of women writers in the novel tradition has come from their equivocal privilege of not being in the world. It's come from the funniness, the oddness, and in some ways, the deprivation of, of women's private lives, their seclusion. Bourgeois women we're talking about here, of course, because working class women were out in factories. Um, they didn't have that, and they weren't writing novels, or well, not many of them, a few. Great insight, thank you for sharing. Yes. like Barbara Cartland and Fifty Shades of Grey and that kind of novel 
um, the sort of thing that would be called chiclet. I wonder if you ever hesitate to discuss in your novels certain themes that feel maybe gendered, maybe more feminine, and maybe less kind of academic in that masculine sense that you talked about earlier. Shall I repeat the question? Because you're, you're quite I'm quiet, sorry. actually. It's, no, it's not, uh, so I think if I understand you rightly, you're saying I mentioned Fifty Shades of Grey dis rudely disparagingly. I've never actually read it, so for all I know, it's a work of staggering genius. Um, <laughs> and Barbara Cartland. I think I have read a Barbara Cartland once, so I know that she is not a writer of staggering genius. So great fun, I'm sure. Uh, do, do I hesitate to write, to address in my writing certain parts of life, certain kinds of experience, because I'm afraid they're not academic enough? Is that, what, is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, sorry, the kind of pigeonholing of women's topics being... Yeah. Certain topics being quite gendered. Um, Some topics being quite gendered, and was I afraid to write about love marriage, motherhood, because it was women's domestic fiction. Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, do you know, I, again, I, I feel that's a bit of my luck, is that although I sort of loved aspects of being at university, and I'm, I've always been a, a critical thinker, and I like ideas, at the same time, I've never felt very narrowly academic. I've always thought, I've always felt free to, to really write about what I wanted to write about. And I, I'm not, you know, I had, I had a great tradition to refer to of writers of all kinds who haven't been embarrassed or inhibited or tried to be clever. Um, oh dear, this is such a big subject, I'm not getting quite to the core of it, am I? There, there is, there was a modernist pressure which I perceived in the 70s and the 80s, of male fiction writers who had, as it were, declared that writing about people as if they were real people, falling in love and having experiences, was sort of foolish. It was for women and children and servants. And some of those writers were great writers, by the way. They were, you know, Samuel Beckett and... Robert Walser and Kafka. I don't think Kafka ever declared anything like that, but that's what his writing is like. There, there was a great monumental male fiction tradition sitting more heavily then in the 70s and 80s, I think, than it does now even, on our shoulders. And it, felt, it did feel, now I'm confessing the truth, it did feel inhibiting. And it did feel as if there was something silly and foolish and indulgent and retro in trying to just write stories of people living in their everyday. Now, I've, I've completely, if you've heard me, I've just reversed about 180 degrees from where I started, because I did feel that. That was an inhibiting factor. And some of those fake novels that I tried to write, which were so dead on the page and smelled so bad, the seventh sense rejected them, were about things like the minor strike in 1984 or 5, or a penal col col colony in New Caledonia that the French in 1870 sent their political prisoners to. I was trying to write intellectual, clever male books, and I did feel embarrassed, actually, about the smallness. I felt my own stuff was too small to be written. And there were, then it was certain reading, I think, that opened the door to go into my, into my home, my small home where I knew what I was talking about. And for instance, I think actually reading the Canadian short story writer, who if you don't know her, you should all read because she's one of the great 20th century writers, is Alice Munro. And it was reading her magnificent short stories, which are made out of dishes and clothes and, and, and dailiness and feeling foolish and all of that ordinariness. And she was a door to me in terms of feeling there was a way of writing about that small stuff which was not 
ridiculous or foolish or demeaning? So actually, that was a really good question, and you sort of winkled something out in me, which I was kind of denying. But, but you're, you're right, there, there was a prohibition. And I have a feeling that now, in 2022, that's kind of less the case. I think those male, those male greats sit on our shoulders a bit less heavily. Although Lily is slightly shaking her head as if, hmm, maybe not altogether. That's interesting. We'll talk more about that. It's a wonderful question then. Beautiful answer. Lily, again, that Lily. <laughs> Claire Lily. You talked really beautifully about the way that novels and reading have shaped you as a writer and as a person. And I was just thinking um, that you, you sort of look back on your Cambridge degree as revolving around these axes of male authority and maybe that holding you back as a writer. If you could go back to your 19, 20-year-old self, would you um, want to reshape her reading this? And if you were going to, what would, what would you give her to read? No, I think I wouldn't, actually. But, but you know, that's a funny thing. You'll, you'll... Well, sort of in retrospect, oh, this is what I'm like anyway, I actually don't want to reshape even, the ba even that 20 years that I spent really very excruciated failing to write. That was horrible, actually. But I'm still thinking, but that, that makes me who I am. So that's, that, that's all, that, I don't want to change it. So going back to my... 19 and 20 year old self. I, I loved reading the Greeks, Shakespeare. I, I'm glad I read the monumental books because they're, monu because they're brilliant. <laughs> but I, I could wish that we'd had Elizabeth Bowen and Elizabeth Taylor and um, Ruma Godden and Jean Rees on our reading list. That's, that's just a corrective. That happened in the decades after I left with Virago publishing all those wonderful major writers. It's a shame. There was always Virginia Woolf, who's kind of my least favourite of them. I think she's the least good of those great 20th century English writers. Um, I don't know why. She was always allowed into the club, um, where, whereas some of the others were kept out. So I do regret that. Well, don't regret it. It was just history. That's how it was, and then I found them. I, I'd actually always known Elizabeth Bowen. This is a, an interesting story. When I was a little girl and a voracious reader, but not really from a bookish family, had books in the house, but kind of a little bit random what was there, and I promoted myself to the adult section, and I'd really love things like Anne of Green Gables with all 12 volumes and Swallows and Amazons with all 12 volumes. So I found Elizabeth Bowen, who was in a uniform edition. I just thought it was like the same thing, a series. So I read her. I think probably nobody sitting in this hall has read Elizabeth Bowen. She's a great, she's my great. She's mid-20th century, writing from the 20s to the 60s, Anglo-Irish, very posh, very extraordinary, nobody like her. She's the great mid-20th century English modernist, uh, Anglo-English modernist novelist, I think, and short story writer. But I read her, and I, I literally didn't know what was going on. I literally didn't know from page to page, what, who are these people? What country are they in? And why is it happening? And why are they getting dressed for dinner? Like, what are they wearing? What are they wearing the rest of the day? Are they just in their night clothes? I just, you know, but that's how you learn. And it was so, it was, but something in it spoke to me. Something aesthetically, the old seventh sense, was vital, you know, exciting, roused my appetite. It was in the sentences. It, I've said this before, but this is really important. It promised me that life was as complicated and rich as I intuited it was. Whereas so much of what I read of weaker stuff would, would um, is that all? Is that all? It seems to be all anybody's offering, but I don't feel it's like that. And then, then you write the writers you love, they, they promise you, even when you're not, you don't know what's going on in the book, but they promise you it's as deep and intricate and difficult to understand as you think. So she, I had this history and then I put her away and then never heard of her again. No one talked about her. I didn't, I'd forgotten even. And then she sort of came back and was republished in, in the 80s 
and people began through Virago really to make a fuss about her and I read her again in the 90s and that was a lovely re-meeting of a hero. But, you know, you're, you, you're reading history as you're reading history and, and I was lucky to be sitting there in that university library reading Sophocles and reading Shakespeare. That was lovely too. Thanks for a great question. Um, life being complicated and rich, we've certainly found that with this panel, with the organisation. Um, anybody? I found it interesting what you were saying about bringing contemporary issues into uh, novels and sort of a more tactful, less preachy, sermony way to do it. Um, I just, I'm really interested in kind of political satire um, and political fiction. So I was wondering if you could just expand on that, maybe talk about what you think makes good uh, for yeah. good um, political fiction versus bad, um, your own kind of experience uh, with it, just, yeah, anything on that topic. I, I probably should have said more than I did, but that's a, my account of it, that you should make the politics almost like a mulch out of which your books... It's, it's kind of for the sort of books I write. And obviously, there can be just a brilliant political satire, which is pretty full-on, which where you know where you are, but it's ironic and clever. And There, there are many different forms of fiction. I'm not sure that we're brilliant at political satires at this moment, which is odd, isn't it? But my, my mind's sort of gone blank in the way it always does when someone asks you to, to uh, can I think of some really funny stuff? There should be. It should be a funny moment, or funny, dark, sinister, frightening, funny moment. That, that there should be the novel rising to our occasion of our now, but... I can't instantly think of the examples, and I wonder whether the continent's better than we are. I do, there's, a, there's a novelist I'm, I'm sure nobody reads here, but he's called Jean-Philippe Toussaint. He's Belgian. He writes really good novels. The, one of them, for instance, is about the EU, which sounds like the most boring subject there ever was for a novel, but it's really good, and it, it has this character sort of going, ending up in China, sort of trying to steal technological secrets, and then he's in Japan. He's a marvellous novelist, and he's deep as well. And yet there's, I th he's good on getting the politics full on into the book in a way that I'm, I don't have that head. The politics are in me all the time, but I, I find this is, it's the, it's the painful bit of my writing. I long to be more political but I don't know how to, I, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to pull it in, in the, in the like I said, in the, in the ground from which the books grow, and, and have my characters talking about it, because I'm trying to represent how we are now, and how we are now is often talking about these things, you know, so in a short story, I, I'll, I'll have people sitting in a garden, and they're, they're talking about, uh, should we call Trump fascism, or, you know, while we were worried about totalitarianism, oh, we forgot about the illiberal democracy. So I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to have the kind of conversations in books that people I know have. But fiction has its own sort of rhythm, and you have to be, you know, you, you don't want to actually literally conduct an episode of Talking Politics, A, because you wouldn't be good at doing that, but just because it, it, it would it would, at a certain point, go slack on the page. There's an aesthetic demand that the thing retain its springiness. I mean, if you read Tolstoy writing about politics in uh, late 19th century Russia, he's good at it. <laughs> he has people doing those conversations, and lots of the people are full of vanity, and they're foolish, or they're idealistic and obsessed. And then others will, will argue with them. So there is a way of putting that fervour, that ferment of debate into the book. I think um, there's, a, there's a contemporary writer here who I'm just discovering. It's, she's only on her second book, but I think she's incredibly good, which is, um, who's called Claire Louise Bennett. I think she's getting something. Like that. Sally Rooney's good at it in, in, her, in her way. And she's trying something quite... That's, that feels new, doesn't it? The way she does her people talking. Occasionally one can feel, uh, can she go on doing that book after book after book without them 
while they're just talking. But at the moment, she can. It's good. It's really interesting how she gets that political talk onto the page. It's a real issue. But it, I think it always is an issue for the novel. And in, in as far as the realist novel is a wonderful thing, a precious record, a precious trace of our lives. And while we're in them, a, f a few novelists are doing their best to sort of catch it. And then, and then time flows past and it all goes into oblivion and there are the novels left, like pieces of anthropology, holding that moment of life. And we should have on the record what, what the politics were, even in all our foolishness and all our blindness to what's happening. We, we should try and hold it in story, in, in art, somehow, because, because we should. Because we don't, we don't want everything to just be forgotten. I don't quite know where that imperative comes from, but it seems very human, doesn't it, to hold our stories and hang on to them as time passes for the future. Well, well, um, we probably got time for one more or two if the response are a little shortage. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Georgia. Uh, when you were becoming a writer, and even now, do you think that it's a useful exercise to sort of genre jump and maybe write a sci-fi horror one day? Or do you think once you've found your niche or area, it's better to just stick to writing that? For me, the, the, having found the way I do things, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of doing something else. I just don't feel I could. It's not me. I've found what I have to say. I mean, also, your publishers go mad, of course, if you do try and genre jump, because they've spent all this effort promoting you as this thing. Oh, no, you want to write a children's book? What? But um, that's, that's a secondary issue. I, I couldn't want to do that. I, 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 it felt as if it took so much work to find how I sound, that that's, that, that's sort of it. And, and sometimes I am a little bit aware. Now I'm embarking on my ninth novel. Oh, God, you know, how long is she going to go on doing this? Well, I'll die at some point. <laughs> you know, we'll go on forever. And luckily, I didn't start till I was 46, so there shouldn't be too many. So I'm trying to find new stories, of course, always new stories, but not, not to... The, the very ground of a book seems fundamental to, to, the, to how you write and to the way you're getting life onto the page. And to casually drop that, to me, sounds like a nightmare, and I would be hopeless at it. There are writers who do it. I'm trying to think whether there are any who've done it well. I don't know. I can't think of any on, this, on the spot, but maybe there are. M my feeling is it takes such a lot of effort to get, to get it right. So once you get it right, then do it. There are some writers who do too, aren't there? There are some writers who are crime writers and then realist writers. And obviously, that balances something in them. And that's fine. Georgia is one of our very talented and up-and-coming singers. So, um, great response. I'll take one more. That would be you there. Um, I just wanted to ask about your writing style and um, maybe if you think it reflects how you felt as a woman while you were finding your, you know, your voice and, and what you wanted to write. Um, because your books take quite an observational tone and I found it very interesting when you said that while you were in Cambridge, you felt like you had intuitive intelligence rather than authoritative intelligence. And to me, sort of, there's a correlation there because, you know, writing about what you observe, that seems very close to, to heart and, you know, that's intuitive. But you also said that novelists shouldn't be prophets. And to me, that sounds like authoritative intelligence. So do you think that your writing style has been shaped by how you felt as a woman, like going through Cambridge and as a mother? I, I kind of do. I mean, I, do, I feel it's come out of my history, the one I've, you've so kindly been willing to listen in on. And, and I do think that why I couldn't do it right for 20 years was because I didn't feel authoritative. But I also feel that maybe I was banking up the intuitive thing all that time. And then when I did eventually find my com confidence, 
Is that it? That sounds too small a word. Because I was perfectly conf... I was actually a bossy reader, always. Always thought I knew about other books. Always thought I had something to say. But I ha there is a bit of the story which I haven't shared with you, is that I did at some point in my late 30s despairing of ever writing anything any good thinking that I was going to be so miserable if I just went on writing and failing. I thought, well, there is this other thing that I can do which is easy, which is being a critic, being an academic. I was a bit, just, you know, careless, more careless than I would be now about that, but I thought, I can do that. And I did, complicatedly, I did end up doing a PhD in English, not here, but at Bath Spa, a new university, which was much better for me because I was actually free to do exactly what I wanted you know, I had no constraints, really. I just wrote a book saying, this is what I think about Henry James, which is hilarious in the context of now. Even at, even at Bath Spa, you wouldn't be allowed to write that PhD now. And I think that writing those sentences, I didn't know this at the time, but I think at the same time, this is mad, I had a three-year-old, I had four boys at home, I had my younger stepson living, I had, a, I had four boys, one of whom was really a baby, I got my first teaching job, teaching English full-time at Bath Spa, and I was finishing my PhD, and I wrote my first novel. That is so not like the person I really am who has breakfast in bed, but there was a strange surge of adrenaline at that moment of my life when I did all those things. And I think that rehearsing confidence, rehearsing being the person who, has the th who knows what they think actually enabled me to get the intuitive material that was all a great reservoir in it. You know, I knew what I knew, but I didn't know I knew it. But I knew what I knew. And then I think rehearsing those sentences of authority in the critical book enabled me to write the first novel, which was alive and which worked. And I think that sounds like a woman's story. You know, not a woman's story for your generation, probably, or for another... But for my generation, that feeling that you didn't have authority, that authority had a male voice, I didn't feel put upon or oppressed, but I, I imagined authority with a male voice myself. I was the traitress, you know? I did. Um, and unlearning that and rehearsing my confidence my authority. That, that was an important moment. So that is a, that's a, the story, really. Yeah. I would like to end the interview on some very short questions and rapid-fire questions, and you just got to give your intuitive seventh sense yeah. response. And <laughs> uh, won't be that one. Um, first thing, what's the worst advice you've ever received? Oh. I don't, I can't, David, I cannot answer that. <laughs> I don't know. My mum, I'm sure it's something my mum said to me, but I'm not sure I'm, there's so yeah. much. Have your hair permed. <laughs> yes, that was bad. It was really bad. What is the last new thing that you've tried? I'm hopeless at trying new things. I've realised in my older age, I've become incredibly conservative about myself, so I... I can't even, it's like nothing like dancing or exercise or r rowing or, I, I just don't even know. <laughs> it's so long ago since I tried anything new. I'm better at traveling. Mm. I'm not a great traveler. I'm shy of going to foreign places and being there and being a nuisance and people not wanting me there. I've always had a bit of a problem with that. But since I've been a writer, when I can go there and have a reason to be there. So there you are, that's a good thing. I've, I've got better at that. What do you think makes a person most attractive? And on a scale of one to 10, how attractive are you on that scale? Uh, I, these are horrible questions. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. I have no idea. I can't answer that. Okay. Um, uh, but it may be something like power plays a part and then N not for myself, I'm talking now about what's attractive, mm. but that's interesting when, I, when one's writing stories to write about people's power being attractive and people's beauty. There's, there's some horrible, arbitrary, given thing, isn't there? Sometimes, sometimes, men and women. 
are just beautiful, mm. like a gift from the gods. Mm. That's amazing. If I can look at that with the lovely, calm, cold impartiality now. That's through the wrong end of a telescope. And final one, which also gives you a chance to share any final message and words of wisdom that you'd like to pass on, is if you could make a law that everyone has to follow, what would that be and why? I, I've got to have some law... Most people need to follow. Yep. Most people or seem to... Or what would you like people to, you know, to do or know? It has to be something political. I would want there to be... I would want world peace, but, you know, that's <laughs> what every uh, beauty queen used to ask for. Mm. I, I would like to remove some of the arbitrary privilege. That this is a, that's a good mm. thing to say sitting in this chamber, isn't it? There we are. <laughs> Great. I Not thought... that anybody here looks as if they have too much arbitrary mm. privilege, but... I thought you may have said um, everyone needs to read or write, but um, that's a no, good response. No, no, there have always been <laughs> loads of people who don't want to read and absolutely, for God's sake, don't want to write. We don't probably need more writers, really. Mm. No, absolutely not. We need writers mm. of... Uh, readers. Readers have always been a funny crew. Readers of fiction are a minority. They're mm. interesting. They're, they're often oddballs. In fact, fiction gets written by all the the lonely weirdos in the playground mm. who can't join in the games. <laughs> and we should have the, all the rest of the other people in the playground we need to have to write about. Mm. Interesting, when Henry James creates Isabel Archer, one of his great heroines, she can't really finish a book. She's often got a book, but she's quite bored and can't wait for someone to knock on the door and ask her out for a meal or for a chat. No, we don't, we, we don't only love readers. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, on that point about um, accessibility in the union, we have actually just opened a new role today, accessibility officer. If you think that there are things that we can improve, feel free to reach out. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my women's and non-binary officer, Tanisha, who has sent hundreds of emails over Christmas, New Year, term time, even with COVID. Um, just, just so I know that you know she, she's meant to be here moderating oh, and well, chairing. And but, she um, wrote some lovely questions for us. Which she did, and I just upon. want to acknowledge her yeah, for that. We should. And tonight is also the final night to apply for the Easter Terms Equalities Committee. And Equalities Committee, um, you can really make the role your own. Guys in my team, including Georgia, we have published the How to Get Involved guide. We've secured more than 15 speakers, organised four panels, including this one, so I guess it's now three panels. <laughs> we've introduced reading groups and socials, a film screening. We've collaborated with other societies, worked on um, the women's and non-binary debating programme, including a new one on style and confidence, which I really encourage you all to attend, all free workshop if you have union membership. We've planned a YouTube debating playlist so that we can leverage our online platform to, uh, so children from all around the world can access our resources. And we've also been organising school visits so more and more mm -hmm. kids can come along and enjoy the facilities that we have here. And so if any of that interests you, do look at apply and feel free to message me. But in the meantime, um, Tessa, it's been wonderful, wonderful having you and we really appreciate you coming here from Cardiff and the insights that you shared and very inspirational, I think, how you had such a, a, a difficult journey and, you know, publishing your first book at 46 and the, just the wisdom and insight you've shared. I'm sure we've all taken at least something away that we can think about for tonight and for me that's um thank you david and thank you for preparing so well at such short notice so <laughs> lovely to have you as my interlocutor thank you can we give tessa a very warm round of applause <laughs> if you would like to stay around for photos and to meet tessa i'm sure that will be possible but thank you so much for coming have a wonderful evening